Homage to him, the Holy One, the Worthy One, the Fully Enlightened One. Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. So I'm happy to be here with you. I hope you all had a pretty good week. <coughs> I hope that things are going easier for all these people that are being chased out of Ukraine. And I hope that they're finding peace and safety and enough warmth and food because it is still a cold season over there. But um, I know Poland has really reached out to people in a great humanitarian way. And um, I hope that everyone will support them to be able to keep supplying them with uh, enough that they can get by there. So tonight we're gonna to look at some questions. And these are questions that are asked quite often. And you might have a question that is, you want to ask. And if you do, I suggest that you put it in the chat. Um, Bonte, are you gonna be here a little bit? I'm here now. Okay, so if he puts it, somebody puts it in the chat, you can pipe up. I don't know how to see it. <laughs> I don't know, but if you have a question, you should feed us a question. Uh, these questions are things that are coming up regularly. And just one second, I'm not sure what's going on, but hold on just a second. I don't realize that I do the, the classes on Wednesday night. I don't remember sometimes and they come to the door. So I'm going to go into some questions that are very common that come up. And um, the first one I want to talk about is the value of testing the advice for yourself. When we give you advice and training for tw uh, practicing TWIM, um, such as how striving and effort are described, we might talk to you about how, what is striving, what is right striving, and then what is right effort. And then I think you've heard me say before, I know I did with the other class, that um, I pretty much decided a, a few, a couple of months back uh, that right effort is basically, you know, it is the six R's. Right, effort has four steps, and the six steps we practice when we're doing the six R's, those six steps are exactly what fulfills the four steps for right effort. So the four steps for right effort, um, we've said before, but I'll repeat them one time, okay? Uh, we recognize when there's an unwholesome mind state in our mind by the tension and tightness that is coming up. That's the craving. And the second step is that we let go of the unwholesome, the attention off of the unwholesome mind state, and we relax our mind. Those two steps are purifying our mind each time we're doing the cycle of our practice. Then the next part of it is we smile as we come back, which is replacing the unwholesome mind state with a wholesome mind state. And that part is retraining your mind. And we repeat this again and again the same way. And that's how our brain learns that when tension starts to arise in us, uh, we want it to just let go and relax and smile and come back to what we're doing. And if you follow these instructions very closely and do it the same way every time, within about a month, maybe two months, you, all of a sudden you'll have an experience. And many of my students have contacted me and said, what was that that just happened? Because I didn't think the six steps or five steps I, and repeat them actually they're happening automatically and this is what i'm talking about when 
people ask me, what is the value of this advice um, that we give you, such as talking about how these are working and whether they are the same thing or not. Anything that we're teaching you, we're asking you from the beginning of your training. Our teachers are supposed to be asking you to test everything. So when I say test it, shouldn't I just accept it that you said it to me and that's the instruction and I should not question? The answer is no. Why am I telling you this? Because throughout the text, there are two things that the Buddha is asking us to do every single time when we're practicing. And the, the Buddha is actually asking us to, to practice in a way where we're practicing what's called knowledge and vision. So to know something by seeing it is what the statement means. Knowledge and vision of how things actually work. And what might that be talking about? That is talking about how does the suffering operate? So this, if we investigate a little step further, this was what the Buddha was investigating precisely. How does the suffering actually happen? And can I see the cause of that suffering? And I know I have experienced a cessation from this with, or experienced what it's like to be without suffering sometimes. How can I have more times in my life where I am suffering? not suffering and having no suffering going on. Now, suffering, to some extent, suffering is always going on. <laughs> we read about that all the time. And it's because we're taking things so personally, and this has to do with atta and anatta. If we are only thinking in terms of atta perspective, then we are taking things personally, and that is causing the tension and tightness in our head, in our mind, when we start to like and want something or we don't like it and we want to try to make it stop or change. Yeah, so the Buddha was using the four steps, the four noble truths as a map for his investigation. And when he taught his monks, he taught them to you practice the same way he was practicing. Now, why do we say this? Because that's all he had to teach. He had to teach what he learned when he was practicing, and he wanted to teach others to use the same investigation and work the same way to uncover things. Now, I recently had someone tell me, you know, there's um, 64 different kinds of people and we should look into every single one of them and find exactly the kind of meditation that they should be practicing. And that's an interesting thing because in the text itself, it's only talking about progress in terms of pleasant or painful uh, practice and clear or unclear comprehension of the Dhamma. And it gives us four examples about your progress when you are watching yourself and you wanna know how exactly am I doing with my practice? So if we were to go to the Digha Nikaya in number 28, section 10, we would find a discussion going on about a thing called the modes of progress. And the modes of progress are four kinds of progress. One is a painful meditation with a slow comprehension of the Dhamma. The second one is a painful meditation, but a clear comprehension of the Dhamma. Both of those are considered poor progress by the Buddha. He's talking to Ananda. In this case, he's telling him, uh, I gave you the, mo Ananda said, you're a marvelous teacher. He said, the Buddha said, why? He said, one of the things is you gave us the modes of progress to the monks. So that when the Buddha's gone, they can judge for themselves 
how am I doing with my practice? Well, it's interesting when you hear these modes of progress, you hear two aspects, you don't hear one. You don't hear I'm having good meditation or bad meditation. It's not quite like that. What is, is standing out is there was a parallel training that was happening. In the Buddhist time, he was teaching a certain amount of foundation Dhamma to support the person to understand only what they needed to understand as a beginner, as they were learning these six topics that we always talk about in our retreats. And we're going to go into this more as we go along uh, in the month of April. I am going to keep talking about this a little bit more step by step. He had a whole system of training people in the meditation and the reason that it was working so well, there are many, many reasons, but the standout reason is in that time period for a teacher, they gave the teacher very much respect. And if you look in Sutta number 15 in the Majjhima Nikaya, there is an examination of the admonishment of a student how I can admonish the student and he doesn't take offense and he follows what I ask him to do or how I give him advice and he ignores me or he prevaricates or he argues with me or he says, yeah, but I need to do what I did before and this combined and stuff and then it doesn't work. And so 15 is an interesting sutta because the effacement sutta was something the monks were supposed to dwell upon, to reflect on often so that they didn't get caught attempting to teach people who were not going to follow instructions. That's why. And when you see that suit, I believe it has 16 different points in it. And if, this, if you do this, it's going to be good relationship and it's going to work for you and the student. If you don't follow, this, then it's not going to work well. It's much the same as Majima number, uh, Nikaya number 95, which is Chanki Sutta. And Ch the Chanki Sutta had the 12 points of the perfect relationship for the student to be successful in the meditation between the student and the teacher relationship. It's beautiful. And you can take that sutta, by the way, if you're not Buddhist, and you can take it to a university and present it in an orientation package to the freshmen, because this description of the student and the teacher relationship is something that will work today in any topic that you choose to study, any subject, and you'll succeed if you follow the instructions in, in the Chanki Sutta. So the Buddha had all this direction, but if we skirt it and try to change it and try to, uh, the other thing we're gonna talk about tonight is, is uh, if we are using words that Today, we would hear those words and immediately think it means work, work really, really hard. Okay, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, because it doesn't always mean that. You can take the same words that look like they're talking about working really hard. And it might mean keep working steadily at doing the instructions exactly the way we're telling you to do it. It could mean that. So this is an, an example of something you need to test personally. We don't advocate or force you to do anything when you're training. That's just pure nonsense. The whole structure of TWIM and the practice of the six R's developed by Bhante Vimala Ramsey was set up uh, because he discovered how it worked so well. And then he started to teach other people. And someone pointed out to him one day at a retreat, it was in Joshua Tree, California in 2005. You know, look at what we're doing, the person said, and gave us a note while Bonte was teaching. We looked at it and we said, you know, that's exactly what we're doing when we practice according to the instructions that we found were working. We are recognizing when there's an unwholesome mind state in your mind. And the, the, the simplest way to learn to train yourself to see early 
that it's coming up, the craving is coming up for the hindrance or distraction that's coming up, the quickest way is to train yourself to sense the arising change in tension and tightness that can happen mostly it happens first in the mind mind is the forerunner of all states and it's happening here first in the head and the mind then it's trickling down through the body you can pick it up in other places too but it first started here so if you watch carefully what's happening here in the upper part of the body the neck and up i'm saying the head if you're watching to recognize that, we can watch, for instance, let me give you an example. In the airport, I really like to do this. When I'm traveling, I like to sit and watch the, the interactions of parents with their children or other travelers that are going to travel together <clears throat> when they get irritated when there's a layover and the plane has to wait longer than it we expected. What happens with people and what you can watch from a distance and see what's happening for a person is the first place they get irritated is in the face here. It comes here and in the hands. The hands are no longer relaxed. They start expressing like this very tightly and you can see the tension in the hands. And then from there, there's a verbal something that happens in, in the distress of having to lay over and on the flight. And um, it's always amusing the, the dramas that go on there, but you can spot the, the craving when it first starts before anything else in the action between the two people or three people that are going on. And that's right there, an example of how when you are training with the twim, then it's time to let, smile and, and notice this. Notice the minute you smile, you've replaced the, mm, I'm all upset about this or that. You've replaced it. And what you've done that, when, when you've done that, you have practiced right effort step by step. You recognize that there was a change in attention and tightness. You let go and relaxed when you smiled and replaced it with a smile. And we can say, well, never mind this, because why? Well, because of uh, what's that thing we learned about? Anicca, yes, Anicca. Everything is impermanent, so whatever this problem is, it can change in just a short time. That's something that's unique. And I have to be honest with you, I didn't pick up on that, one of my students picked up and pointed it out to me by personal experience she had in her family situation during COVID and pointed out that normally she would get involved with the, the, um, the conflict that was in front of her with the other people, but instead she stood back and watched and made a conscious choice to let go of it and say, never mind, and walk away to another part of the house and continue working and not get involved where normally she would get involved. And when she did that, she's the one that pointed out to me, you know, this is, this is twim in action. Watching what is happening in front of you is a way to practice twim uh, when you're amongst people and watching what's happening around you and then sensing how it's affecting you. Are you able to be in a group of people and practice by noticing if you're taking things personally or are you seeing things as they actually are. So that is the way that we talk about seeing something as it actually is or, or seeing it as it's not essential and unessential. What is essentially going on and what you're watching? Is it really personal? Or is it unessential? Are you comparing it to other things that happened in the past and you're gonna jump in again? Well, so see how we go from what subject we're talking about. In Buddhism, a lot of times it tumbles into other subjects that help us to get it even clearer. So the first one was the value of testing advice for yourself, such as how striving and effort 
are described. Now, what did I discover about striving and effort that made me decide to go in this direction tonight was kind of, kind of fun. If we go, if, if you have the Majima Nakai, I'm gonna tell you what pages to go to, <clears throat> okay? Um, right striving and right effort are the same thing. That's true. And what I told them about a couple of months back was I felt like we needed to look at right striving and say, perhaps right striving is describing right effort. This isn't just an idea and see if it works for you. But the right effort steps are exactly the same as the right striving steps in most cases in uh, the index when you look up the right striving. They're exactly the same. But these are very interesting to look a little bit more closely at, to take a look at what happens in translation in Buddhism when we're dealing from Pali to English. Now, I'm not a Pali scholar, but this one I can get by with explaining it. And then if you're a Pali person, you can go and look a little deeper, you know, and talk to it in even more a better reflection. But when we go to where there is the description of either the right effort or the right striving, here's what we hear. How practicing uh, does a student practice the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits or to step away from the unwholesome mind and change it? <clears throat> this one is talking about habits. And this is found in Sutta number 78. And I'm at the top of page 651, if you want to follow. So here, um, a monk or a student awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. And he makes effort arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives, okay? So how it is, he's talking about it, how does it work exactly? He awakens the, the, uh, the zeal, this, or the, we say enthusiasm instead of zeal. It's the same thing. When we change a word, I want to make sure you understand this. When I was taught to change to work with the words, and Bonte and I went, Bonte Vimala Ramsey and I went back and forth and back and forth. And does this work? And watch the students in the retreat. And does this word work the most effectively for the meaning? Or is it a word that's not working well at this time in history? Is there a synonym? And we would go to the sources. The sources are different than dictionaries. The sources have synonyms in them. So we're looking through a vast number of words. If we were to look up uh, the word um, for, um, let's see, do this one here. Somebody's um, asking which book we are using. Majima Nikaya uh, by Bhikkhu Bodhi on um, page 651, and we use the Bhikkhu Bodhi translation systematically. That's the one we depend on most. Um, when you look at these words that are describing the um, right effort and right striving, you're going to run into words like effort and arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. Now, when you consider these four words, I want you also to consider what my grandmother said, <laughs> okay? And she taught me when I was young and I was cleaning the porch on a big old house that she had down at the seashore. Um, she said, you know, there are easier ways for you to do this. That's what she said first. And then she said, you should teach yourself in life to work smart, not hard. Don't work so hard and long, try to work smart. So what she was telling me is you really need to understand what it is you're trying to do and what the word is that's being used and how you are going to accept it 
and you are going to activate that word. So if we look here, we see these words and you can write them down. I don't have a screen to do this for you on this computer yet. I haven't figured out how to do that. <clears throat> but take effort is the first word. Energy, arousing energy is the second. Exerting his mind or her mind and striving. Okay, so these are the words they're going to use in this description. Now, I know that in some practices, the pe it, people work really, really hard. The concentration is very hard. It's very heavy. Okay, and the emphasis on words like this would be supporting that and supporting to work really, really hard. But when we're teaching TWIM, we are teaching you something we figured out that really can happen. And that is <clears throat> the setting free of the mind, allowing it to naturally uh, work, naturally operate in. So, so if you're talking about effort, when you're talking about these four steps in right striving, it would mean the effort to complete the instructions every time you do it. If I look at it that way, then maybe I don't have to work as hard with any pressure on my mind if I understand my effort is to complete the steps precisely. That's one way of looking at effort. <clears throat> Another one is to arouse energy arousing energy we need energy to keep our practice fresh we need energy and we need the energy to do the steps and it takes energy without energy we cannot have movement we cannot have steps proceeding and results coming we can't so the energy has to be there to complete the steps in the instruction but it doesn't mean the energy has to be here to be forceful to make anything happen. This is not what it says. Okay. And then exerts his mind. He applies his mind to complete the steps. That's all. You see? And so it's not about working hard. It's about working smart and knowing exactly what has to happen for successful striving to take place. And then it says he strives. And to strive is to do it, to carry it out, to strive. When you train me on a bike for long distance and you teach me everything I need to know to go 50 or 70 miles in a, in a ride when I was riding long distance training, I have to strive to complete what you told me to do in the instructions and keep going and not stop until I reach the destination. That's what it is in striving. But it doesn't mean I have to wear myself out. If I have correct training for pedaling, correct training for gear shifting, correct balance for everything on the cycle, when I'm riding a 21 speed bike, it doesn't mean I have to work hard. It means I have to work smart to have easy transitions between gears, easy transition for pedaling, easy transition for everything I'm doing on the bike. Well, their instructions for carrying out right effort are not difficult. People take these, we find sometimes, and they we say, did you tell me what you did for the steps? And they would say something like, I recognized there was a hindrance and I, I released it, my attention off of it. And then I relaxed and, and then I, uh, I smiled and I came back and I said, how long did it take you to do this? About five or six minutes. Why? That's my first question, why? Well, I could feel there was still some, some uh, relax. I need to relax my uh, arms and I had some, in my shoulder, I had to relax. I had to take care of relaxing my chest. And I'm there. we didn't tell you to do that. And this is where the time we live in, in modern times, is a crazy time right now. And you know, I know places in Washington, DC, if you went to apply for a job and I went to apply for a job, that you would try as hard as you could to get that job 
by presenting 32 or 40 different points to get that job when they were asking for a solution for something. But if you do that, it, you might even get hired <laughs> because everything is so complex and you're gonna make 30 or 40 new people get jobs to be involved with all the steps you're taking. But what if you could solve the problem by presenting only six steps instead? Would save people money, it would solve the problem and everything, but it's a strange thing nowadays. And we are so complex oriented, we are so compounding of things that uh, if you tried to do that and get the job by just a few things to do for the solution, the likelihood in the government right now in the United States is you would not get the job. I was in human resources for 14 years. This is just the way it works. So we're living in a, in a time where we think we have to push and it's a lot of force, not necessarily smart as working hard. If we look at what happens in our meditation, we're trying to show you the way that TWIM works so successfully is just by the steps of the TWIM as we give them to you. And actually to run the cycle shouldn't take you more than two or three seconds at the most. That's all it is. It's recognized that you're, you're, there's tension and let go of your attention off of it, relax, smile and come back. That's all there is to it. And if you keep doing that to the brain again and again, the neurological research tells us the way that we can change habits, the way that we can change the way we do things can happen for us. And by changing the habit, by setting up a new habit and doing it so that the brain picks it up when it's done the same way every single time. So if you change it, and I have people come to me sometimes in retreat, what did you do? Well, I let go and I smiled and I came back. What did you skip? <laughs> now you have to tell me what did you skip? Okay, then they'll say, I relaxed and relaxed and relaxed. Well, that was good, but did you smile? You didn't smile. Well, I didn't feel like smiling. Well, what did we tell you about smiling when we asked you to smile? This is not a silly, goofy smile. And we're not, we, we told you if you were taught correctly, and this is, this is the caveat here. If you were taught correctly when you began to practice TWIM, you should have had someone instruct you, you do not have to feel happy to smile. It has nothing to do with that. It's like me saying, I have to be smiling in order to shift my bike into the next gear. It says shifting my bike into the next gear has nothing to do with whether I'm smiling or not. It's whether the gear shift is going to operate correctly to get to the speed that I want to move at on the bike when I shift it. That's all. So what does the smile have to do with that? Well, it relaxes me if I smile and I shift, but if I'm uptight and I try to shift, it doesn't always work as well. And I drop out and cannot keep up with the other people that way. This is just an example. With the TWIM, it, it is simple. The steps are simple. The reason it's difficult for you to get it to work is most of the time, if we talk to you, Closely enough, we're going to find out you put other ingredients in with it. You threw in other things. Well, then it isn't the same recipe. And if it didn't work, I'm not surprised at all. You see, that's where that comes to. So nothing, no one is forced to do anything um, as far as uh, being asked to uh, do the instructions in TWIM when we do it. We're just asking you to try to get it going with your brain and agreement to recognize, release, relax, smile, come back. That's it. There's really five steps. You probably figured this out by now. <laughs> There's five steps in it, not six. The sixth one is to please repeat these five steps again and again and again. Whenever the tension arises, you do it again and again and again.
okay? So the lesson in this is when we listen to these sections, I'll read them through to you now, and you try to remember what I said about effort, I said about energy, and about exertion, and about striving. It just means follow the instructions. If you apply those words to following the instructions, instead of thinking about physically forcing or physically working too hard, okay? So it's the first one is you, um, you think about the non-arising. And so it means the same thing if I say recognize something has arisen, an unwholesome state, you sense it, okay? And you make effort and, the, and keep yourself aware, arouse energy to keep yourself aware and have the exertion and striving to do the following steps. He awakens enthusiasm for abandoning. That's the second step, to abandon whatever was unwholesome. So that means let go of your attention on it, uh, uh, the evil unwholesome state. And then it follows again, he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. He awakens zeal for the arising of unarisen wholesome states. So now he awakens the enthusiasm to bring something up. And the smile is simply the fastest one. And the reason you smile is because it replaces an unwholesome state, immediately lightens your mind, and opens it up here in the front. So any problem you have, from pressure up here or any headaches, anything that happens like that, it's because you're not smiling. And when you just sit here now and you smile, you feel more uplifted, open in the head, and you need that. And then he awakens his enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-disappearance, the strengthening and the increase and fulfillment by development of the arisen wholesome states. Okay, that's a big one. So let's look at that. Enthusiasm for the continuance of this open feeling in your mind, no pressure, non-disappearance. We cannot make anything stay. We cannot stop the mind from thinking. There is nothing in the text tells us we're supposed to stop our brain from operating. Your brain is a remarkable machine. It manages everything in your body, everything in your body. And so we're not asking you to stop it. We're asking you just to watch it, to witness it, and let go of anything that is heavy or pulling you down or negative. So the non-disappearance part and then strengthening it, strengthening your, your understanding of what this feels like when it's a wholesome state. Increasing means increase the, it means to increase states like this in your life all the time. Uplifting states allow your brain, your, your, uh, your mind and the brain to operate with much more power and the potential of your mind is fascinating. But if we're tense, we don't get to do that. So new innovative thoughts, new ideas and things that are in there that they can't come out. And this includes insights cannot come up. So whenever we're tight, we're stopping the insights from coming up and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. Fulfillment is to keep practicing as you're observing. And once you learn, you begin, your brain becomes familiar with how it feels when it feels good. And we'll want this more. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. So once so practicing, these practices the way to the sensation of unwholesome uh, habits. This is the way for the cessation of the unwholesome habits. Now this suit is interesting because then it talks about wholesome habits and it shows you the way to the end of wholesome habits as well. Why does it do that? <clears throat> Someone asked me that once and I said, well, when you have a severe imbalance of something like if we're here, and when we have a severe imbalance on the unwholesome side, we're going to show you how to let go of those. 
but you're still going to have the wholesome ones. You don't want to get involved with them. You want to get involved less and less and see them for what they are essentially not get involved in making more spinning circles in dependent origination pop up and start operating with concern for unwholesome or wholesome because why because the conditions you need to fall into cessation and come out of it and come experience the experience of nibbana which is like a rebooting of the mind an opening of the mind clearing away all of past thoughts and future thoughts and just being empty for a split second and coming back to the experience of only in the present time with no craving. And then it fades away and fades away until you master this and eventually reach the super mundane Nibbana experience. I don't want to go into the whole thing about that right now, but We've talked about the attainments before. I won't go into that. But what it's telling you is the way, the system of how you can clear things away are the unwholesome ones are the worst ones because we habitually all our life have dived into the unwholesome ones, kept ourselves involved with this Atta uh, perspective. And we have been holding on to things and demanding and pulling, pushing and shoving as we move through life. We want to let go of all of that. So this is why understanding this is important. So this one says basically pretty much the same thing as it would say when you're talking about the, um, the striving uh, that is on in, in Mizjima Nakai number 77 on page 636. You have a comparative um, paragraph called Four Right Kinds of Striving at the bottom. It's in section two, it's in section 16. Najima Nikaya number 77, section 16, okay? And um, that's going through the 32 requisites of enlightenment. This 77 goes through each one and uses striving in that one. Now, having said this to you, what striving, how it's exactly, it's pretty much exactly like right effort. Now watch what happens when we go to sutta number 85. And I'm actually answering probably the third question at this point. Uh, I'll go back to the second one in a minute. But are striving and right effort the same thing always in our practice or are there two kinds of striving or two kinds of right effort? Are there two kinds? But this is directed to striving first, what I'm going to say. Uh, because if you go to Majima Nikai number 85 on page 707, in section 58, you get a lesson on five factors of striving. So on page 707, I'm going to read that to you. Here, he's explaining to a prince that there are five factors of striving. And what five? Here, uh, a bhikkhu has faith. And he places his faith in the Tathagata's enlightenment thus, that the Blessed One is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge, conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened and blessed. He puts his faith in that. What we're asking you to do is when you try TWIM, just put your faith in the fact that we're not going to teach you unless we've experienced what we're talking about. That's what we're asking you to do. We try to ask people not to teach anything they haven't experienced for themselves. So, so what we try to do um, is have people that you feel good about putting your faith in them, giving you the instructions. Now, it's a very difficult thing because what we find is when people start teaching, um, I think 
it's easy to get impatient when you're teaching and you tell someone something, they don't follow it. So instead of saying it the same way over and over and over again, which is the most difficult part of this, teaching this, you're supposed to be saying it over and over again, the same exact way because of the neurological research that tells you how the brain learns it. That's why this is deductive reasoning. But that is one of the hardest things and that sort of takes your energy if the person keeps deviating off the instructions. But you're supposed to be saying it the same way every single time. And when you practice that way, um, you'll find out when it works, it really works because the person followed the instructions exactly. If there's something that happens that the person is getting exhausted, the person wears themselves out, almost burns their brain out sometimes. Why did it happen? Because they were striving in the wrong way. They were exerting the energy in the wrong way. The words that we use talking about striving, they took to heart and used it in the commonplace definition from an English dictionary in this day and time, not considering that maybe what it was saying was just pertaining to the instructions themselves. Strive to keep the instructions going. Keep your energy going so you keep striving. Don't give up and that sort of thing, all right? So the first one was to have faith. The second one, he is free from illness and affliction, possessing a good digestion, that is neither too cool nor too warm, but medium and able to bear the strain of striving. Now, the thing is, the strain of striving in our case is the length of time you're in, in sitting, you know, and it, even if you're not pushing, it takes a bit of determination to sit the longer sittings, but it's not necessary for you to push to sit longer sittings. This needs we need to be certain this is not misunderstood. This is very important. You see, we know some things about reaching cessation now we didn't know a few years ago. We looked back over many of the reports that I had kept in my research and found out a person must be able to, um, we know very few exceptions to this, if there's any, of hundreds of people that were, were uh, kept records on, for 12 years and going back through those records, anybody that reached cessation had sat at least one time for three hours. And that's, I'm willing to say it now because I saw it on the charts. Nobody got there without sitting at least one time. So as you're learning, it's not something you strive for. This is, you have to go from the beginning and allow your mind to open. And these levels are not difficult to go through if you're allowing them to happen naturally. But if you are trying to get to them, then they aren't, you're not gonna to get to them. It's simple. If you want it, you can't have it. It has to do with craving and personal desire. And it's a lust and determination in the wrong direction for the support of the practice. To, put your, to put your mind on getting there, that's okay. That's my destination eventually. But putting pressure on yourself at all in the practice stops the practice from moving forward. Why? Well, because pressure to get there is a form of tension and tightness and slows the whole thing down. So this is one of the things that is not going to work. And I used to tease him in the beginning of my retreat, just, just remember if you want it, like it was a great day. I sat, I had a great sitting today. Tomorrow you come and you give me the report and you said it was so good yesterday and I wanted it to happen again today. Well, that's why it didn't. Simple. If you want it, you can't have it. Just tuck that in there. If you allow it, your, your, your uh, whole purpose in this practice is to allow and observe how everything is working, not to grab it and make it work in any way, just to follow these steps. So 
Now, the second one of this saying free from illness and affliction, you're eating properly, you're resting properly, possesses a good digestion because why? Because when we eat in the morning and we eat at lunch when we're in retreats, or if we're doing that all the time, you can do it all the time too, okay? It's a very healthy thing because if you're going to do anything in the afternoon and you need your energy for sitting in the afternoon, digestion takes a lot of energy out of your body. And it takes it the strength away from the person to be digesting if you are eating certain kinds of foods. So if you, you know, feel like you're really, really, really hungry and you can't stand it, best advice is five nuts when you have lunch, five nuts, five almonds or five cashews, I don't care, or five peanuts. Why is this going to work? Because that is hard food, but the majority of your meal is going to be digested, but the hard food will sustain you longer. Yeah. So you try that and you see what happens. For me, it's exactly five was what Bonte recommended to me in the beginning. And it turns out it's very accurate. So if I go to four, it doesn't work out. If I try three nuts, it doesn't work out. It's very funny. So neither too cool nor too warm, but it's medium and able to bear the strain of meditation. Take away the word striving, say the meditation and not have that disturb you in any way. You're not supposed to be suffer, suffer, suffering through this. You're not. But if we take the words and apply them in the wrong way, we can make it sound like we really need to suffer, suffer, suffer through this. We, we don't need to be doing that. Uh, okay, the third one, third point here is he is honest and sincere. He shows himself as he actually is to the teacher and his companions in the holy life. And this basically has to do is don't lie to your teacher. I'll be very blunt. Don't lie to them. Tell them as clearly as you can in very simple words if they say, what happened new in your longest practice that you had in the last 24 hours? What happened that was new that you want to tell me about? And just tell them simply, no stories, no situations, no anything about living situations, nothing like that at all. Just your practice, just do it that way. And these things, other things will work themselves out if you develop your practice, it will help you immensely. Okay, and then the next one is, then he is energetic in abandoning unwholesome states and is undertaking wholesome states. He is steadfast, launching his effort with firmness and persevering to cultivating the wholesome states. And that is, this is the part that's telling you about the right effort in this, this fourth one. It's talking about right effort is happening all the time, all the time. That's what you're trying to do until it becomes automatic. And then the fifth one is, then he is wise. He possesses wisdom regarding rising and disappearance that is noble and penetrative and it leads to the complete destruction of suffering. Now, what does it mean, the rising and the disappearance that is noble? If you go to 148, it breaks you down very, very well in the Chichaka Sutta has something inside it. You go to this section, I'll tell you what page it's on for making Nibbana possible. There's two sections in that where it's impossible or it is possible and when you go to the um, section where it is possible, it's 148, <clears throat> the abandonment of the underlying tendencies, it's, it happens in both the underlying tendencies and the abandonment of the underlying tendencies, but the five words for you to put in your head and remember, what am I doing when I'm practicing this meditation? What am I trying to see and understand so clearly I can put it in a nutshell? If one understands as it actually is the origination, the disappearance, 
the gratification, the danger, and the escape from the arising phenomena. They're talking about the hindrances. They're talking about what comes up to block you. When one is touched by this neither painful nor pleasant feeling, if one understands as it actually is, how it operates, the origination, how did it arise? And how does it disappear? And how do I personally get involved with it? That's what gratification means. What is the danger of getting personally involved with something? Hmm? Ah, we're not in the present time anymore. We've left it. We've gotten involved in something in our mind. And the escape in regards to this feeling, okay? Then the underlying tendency to ignorance does not lie within one. And that one shall here and now make an end of suffering by abandoning the underlying tendency to the lust for pleasant feeling by abolishing the underlying tendency to aversion towards painful feeling. By extirpating, it means pulling it out by the roots, the underlying tendency to ignorance in regards to the neither painful nor pleasant feeling by abandoning ignorance and arousing true knowledge, true knowledge of how all of this works, this is possible. The person can get to Nibbana, okay? So if this sutta was one of the first ones I ever memorized and it was really a good sutta because of these five things. How does it originate? The phenomena, how does it come up? Mm -hmm. How does it originate? How does it disappear? How does it go away? How do we get personally involved in it? And what is the danger of that? And what is the escape? And the escape is twin. The escape is the right effort. And the escape is seeing everything that's happening impersonally. That's the anatta part of this. Anatta is uh, not taking things personally at all. Understanding the whole experience is a impersonal process of human cognition and watching it like the scientist like the explorer that's what you're doing okay so that's that part of you see what i described for you in this one in 85 was showing you another setup for describing striving so that striving, when we look at it, is interesting because when we look at what's in 85, it supports what's in 77 and the other locations for striving and for right effort, for both of them. These factors have to be there. Hmm? So that's what that was pretty interesting to turn that up and find it. Okay. Now, the other question I am just going to speak to a little bit, and that is about what's been happening uh, for us with um, how much information, this is sort of, you have to uh, reason this out for yourself, but how much information is actually necessary to know about the jhanas before I first experience them and first able as a beginner to go through them? Hmm, interesting question. And the reason this is interesting is because if we read some of the things that we've written too soon, before you experience the jhanas, we can find ourselves getting caught, not being able to get to the right condition to fall through these jhanas and experience them, why? because we're going to be thinking too much about, am I to this factor? Am I to that factor? Can I see this one? Can I see that one? And if you start doing that, you're going to slow yourself way down in your progress. So reading about it turns out to be fine to read about them and to memorize the parts of them and everything. Once you go into training and you get through a retreat where you've experienced how it works to fall into them, a natural way. But if you have too much in your head to think about, this can hold you up and slow you down. 
That's all I wanted to point out about this. And this is the same issue we have with Abhidhamma. We do not condemn Abhidhamma. There's some rumors going around, we condemn Abhidhamma. We want to burn Devasudhi Maga. We want to get rid of it. It's not true. It's not true. I want you to just think about it for a minute. Where does the barrier method come from? It doesn't come from the texts. It came from the preservation of the commentaries that were involved in the building of the Vasudhimaga. It comes from the section on the Brahma Viharas in the Vasudhimaga. The only thing that was changed slightly in that was the practice itself is not the same as it's described in the Visuddhimagga because it didn't work. And what you had to do was find the practice where it was working exactly the way they're describing it in the Visuddhimagga, but the, if you're using the, um, the, the steps of right effort properly, then all of a sudden it becomes a reality and it does work. And that's just what happened. So that's one. Where do we get the, the description of five kinds of joy from? That's fascinating. It's not in the text. Well, where did it come from? Well, it came from the Abhidhamma. I'm sorry. It came from the, the, the Sudhimaga. The descriptions of joy are there. Um, where do we first see uh, the expression for uh, the meaning of concentration used in the Vasudhimaga? Where do we first see the idea of um, productive concentration? Well, we find that in the Vasudhimaga one more time, you see? So it isn't that we don't use the Vasudhimaga, it's that we don't rely on it as the prime source that is absolutely correct and in agreement with the texts without checking against the suttas first and against beside the instructions we're using to see if it's useful. And we have told people, I have been doing this since 2000. It's 2022 now. And all these years, every retreat, we explain to you what the Buddha said in the Paranibbana Sutta. It's very simple. You can try anything you want. And if it works, keep it and use it. If it agrees with what's in the suttas, then it's getting you there. But if it's making you take 10 years to get to the first jhana or five years to get to the first jhana, there's something odd. Or else the Pali is wrong and the translations are totally wrong. And it's absolutely not possible for the last section of the Satipatthana Sutta to be true. It can't be that that was happening. And you'd have to make up a whole story about why it was possible in the time of the Buddha and it's not possible now. You see, that's silly. It's just not, it doesn't make sense to me, you know? So when we started in the section on, um, I think it's chapter three, is the beginning of the subject of meditation on the very first page, page 81 of the Vasudhimaga. This is the first time we find something. It wasn't, it wasn't productive. It was profitable. Profitable unification of mind. Now, let me read to you what it says here. It says, what is concentration? Concentration is of many sorts and has various aspects. And the aspects, he talks about what he's going to talk about in the aspects above, um, how, where it's used in everything in relationship to uh, in what sense is concentration, what is it, and what are the characteristics and functions of this uh, manifestation and proximate cause of it, and how many kinds of concentration are there, and what is a, its defilement, what stops it from being correct, and what is its cleansing aspect, how does that work, how should it be developed, what are the benefits of the development of concentration. Now, calling it collectedness, I will tell you here and now, is not new. 
and Bontimi Ramsey is not the first person who's used the word collectedness, as some people like to say. That's not true. There are other monks that used a collected mind, trying to get the person to understand that concentration doesn't, it means collected in what you're doing. It doesn't mean concentration, you see? So once again, it comes down to the cultural time that human beings are living today and the complexities of how we deal with things and how we use concentration in our life. When we say concentration, we immediately think we need to squint and concentrate hard. It's just where we are. Having gone through the industrial revolution, having gone through the computer revolution, the space uh, revolution, everything is getting us in this place of concentrate, like this very, very hard pointed way, see? But here it's saying very clearly when after he looks at these different parts and he's going to take them apart later on in the chapter, but he makes it clear for this whole book what concentration is. He says, what is concentration? Concentration is of many sorts and has various aspects. An answer that attempted to cover it all would accomplish neither its intention nor its purpose, and it would besides lead to distraction. And so we shall confine ourselves to the kind that is intended here, calling concentration profitable unification of mind. Now, when I teach, I usually will tell people up front, we're showing you how this practice works and operates. We believe that the Buddha, when he got through, when he went through, um, comes back and attempts to figure out during his life how to give you the simplest way of using the escape he found. So he found a day-to-day -day escape that can be used all the time, not just talking about the final super mundane Nibbana, which is the remainderless fading away and cessation of craving. That means it's permanently gone for good. But what about all the little mundane Nibbanas that we experience and the mundanes of the mundanes, like during the day, have you ever had a time where your mind just goes blank to the past thoughts, blank to the future thoughts, and you're just here and now looking out over the vastness of a valley at the foot of a set of mountains and you so totally are in the present time, in the present moment, there is no craving at all. That's like a teeny weeny little what? A teeny weeny little mundane Nibbana experience. Then you'd start thinking about what you have to do when you get down to the bottom of the mountain and how long is it gonna take you to get down there? And are the people gonna be down there to pick you up to take you home when you get down to the bottom of the mountain? <laughs> but that one spot right there, that's it, you see? So getting into what Nibbana is, the closest thing I've heard anybody explain to me about Nibbana to date came from some of my students who said, you know, what happened here was we rebooted our mind, like crashing the computer and turning it off and just shutting it down and starting it again. And at a default level, you rebooted your mind. And that's about really accurate of what is happening to your brain when it happens. And then from there, you're a bit gentler because you can know for sure that the past stuff can really not be there and the future pressure not there. And you can be here and now. And when that starts happening and starts broadening and starts getting a little longer for you, as you relax into knowing that's a possibility. So this was the antidote. This was the the um, the escape that is spoken of when we're talking about phenomena and we're talking about anatta and we're talking about this sort of thing. So the question is here, how much information do we really need that is necessary to know about the jhanas before we first experience them? 
we've come up with the foundation pieces for you in the retreats that we give. If you take an online retreat with us, you should be able to get an idea of the six subjects that are put together to help you. And if you look uh, at a personal retreat and you go to an on-site retreat, you definitely have that experience day to day with your teacher. You begin to understand many people have told us over the years, I learned more in this 10 day retreat than I have in five or 10 years about the Dom and how it all works together in conjunction with the practice to support it. The Eightfold Path, the Four Noble Truths, the Dependent Origination, it's clear to me now how it, I can use this in my daily life. I can use it for my practice, I can use it in business, I can use it in a lot of different ways. So that's as far as I'm gonna go right now. I'd like to ask you if you have any questions about anything that I've talked to you about tonight and throw the floor open. But I know somebody has a question out there. I just know it. <laughs> Does it make sense to you what we're doing with this? You, can I ask you or anybody questions? Or any comments also. <laughs> oh, comments too. <laughs> Wonder about <laughs> Yeah, I'm afraid my camera's got a problem, so you can <laughs> see I'm very blurred. That's okay. Uh, you're in England. I thought they had a lot of fog anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, 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 the comment I wanted to make was uh, uh, I found it very useful to listen to the uh, description of um, the strivings, and I missed the, I missed the reference. Um, uh, about the five characteristics of striving, uh, which I it perhaps could be in the comments or or, or afterwards, um, because I think striving is a is a tricky word in the, certainly in the English language, and um, I, I'm 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 interested to try and th conceive of a different um, a, a different um, relaxed. Uh, but um, present effort um, that kind of matches what is consistent with uh, with twim, because uh, striving certainly uh, in my mind uh, and in my uh, understanding is all about uh, uh, you know doubling down and and um, and making a renewed effort. Um, and certainly in styles of meditation that I used to practice many years ago. Uh, that was a very much encouraged uh, aspect of mm -hmm. uh, of the practice. Mm -hmm. um, in in fact, you know, if it if it wasn't intense, it wasn't working. And and twim is very different. Um, and the, the differences are, are are very important. But the the differences are as much in the effort as you make as in the attitude of mind. That's right. Um, and and striving gets in the way of the attitude of mind. It, the word striving, if you like, gets in the way of the attitude of mind. So listen, listen just for a second. I pulled out the thesaurus for you, so I could whip through this real quick. But if we go to the verb to strive, this is how this all gets started. You know, uh, try, try hard, attempt, endeavor, make an effort, make every effort, exert oneself, do one's best, do all one can, do one's utmost, uh, labor, toil, strain, struggle, bend over backwards, go all out, okay? 
give it one's best shot. So see, there was a mixture of words in there. Some of them were really were severe, but others were not. But what mm -hmm. my point is culturally, why did we choose to go? It, the big dilemma here, of course, is poly to English. It's the standard yeah. argument and debate forever. We yeah. and I at the university where I was in Sri Lanka. He said to me once, why don't you stay for five years? I said, well, why would I want to come back to school and stay for five years in my 70s? He said, because we need somebody who wants to make a dictionary. It's been a standing debate forever with these Pali scholars. We needed an, an English dictionary that works in conjunction with Pali. You see mm -hmm. his problem? Because the average person, then what we thought about after he said that, we went into a further little discussion and took a few months and sat down. We all talked about learning language and linguistics. So if I learned Spanish, how did I treat it? Now I was about a B plus student. I wasn't an A student, but I was about a B plus B minus student. And, and I got through just fine with my Spanish. But to be honest, when I went to look up those 20 words each week or something in the dictionary, Spanish dictionary, I only read the first justification of what the word meant. I didn't read all these words. So I questioned them in English as a second language. They're, they have very poor vocabularies, these monks. In internationally, this is a thing. They have very poor English, a lot of them. And they don't try to build the thing and they don't know what a thesaurus is most of them have never heard of one but if you went to a dictionary you know you have um the word tranquility if you went to the dictionary the or what was the one when it oh gosh well there was one word we were working with and the definition for it in buddhism was there but it was like the seventh definition down. So no one would ever go down that far in the description of what the word meant. If you're doing your homework for 20 words, you're going to go to the dictionary and read a few words, and that's what you're going to say it means. You're not going to go and read everything that word could be used for. You see, that's my argument. And so what's happened in our generation and the last generation is it has started to lean. Now, you see, in the Vasudhi Maga, I told you what he said as the conclusion of what he meant in the word, um, was it productive or profitable? Profitable. So what would be profitable as far as concentration in meditation to achieve the experience of the jhanas and to go down the path? You see? And it, what, what's strange is that when he did what he did in telling you that that's what it meant, what happened afterwards was comical because the next two pages, he blew it out of proportion. <laughs> so I'm telling you the truth, he did. I mean, I, I think it's the next page. And I just, that's where I just put the book away. I said, well, forget about this because when when you go into the next page, it gets out of sorts and it turns in, into something dreadful. And then that's what floats through. And that's what is picked up. And when you go to concentration and look at it, you wonder, well, how can this be when you go back to the suttas and start reading about what they're asking you to do? This is not going to work. Mm -hmm. And that's why it isn't working. You know, because people are not testing it properly. To really test it, you have to look at those words and see if any of them will work in a context with Buddhism. The, the English dictionaries are not built to work with Buddhism. That's what the professors were trying to get across to me. But for somebody to attempt to do that project, he said a minimum of five years wow. you see, to do it. Because you would have to work, uh, you know, really industriously to take all the words that you would have to figure out all the words that are being used in talking about Buddhism first and then you could clump it down to those and you could work from there you don't have to have a complete dictionary but but um it's tricky you're right it's tricky um, mm -hmm. yep yeah I mean you you need you need a sense of commitment and you do need a sense of endeavor. Sure. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's like, it's very much like um, 
uh, the word disenchantment, which can be also translated as um, disgust. And yes. <laughs> for me, disgust has a negative energy. It has an yeah. energy of revulsion. Well, yeah, exactly. And revulsion. Revulsion is the word. Revulsion. Yeah. And, yeah. and disenchantment actually has a, a, a releasingness of, to it. You know, you, you, you're gaining something from the disenchantment, whereas the revulsion, you're putting something in. Yes, exactly. To, to revol you go have to do. So what we did was uh, someone threw in $100 or more and got Bonte the, um, it's huge. It's a huge book on the history of words where when we really wanted to tear one apart to see why does it not work or why does it work? Well, what was the base word? For instance, ignorance, ignore, to ignore is the root word for ignorance. So mm. the question pops up, ignore what? Mm. And so the first link is saying, if you're in a position where you don't understand the four noble truths, and you don't understand the three characteristics and you don't understand how to use at least seven of those 12 links all the time in your life uh, as you're living life to understand how everything is happening and operating, uh, then you don't understand this. You see, you're ignoring them. But you, then the person says, well, I feel terrible. I ignored it. And then I said to them, no, don't ever be angry at yourself because nobody else did either. And nobody told you anything about it. So how can you get blamed for ignoring something that no one even told you existed? And that's the way out of that one, <laughs> you see. Yeah, uh, so language, language, I mean, what's really interesting because, because TWIM is, um, a releasing and a softening, I think it becomes much more sensitive to language than other types of practice. I agree with you. I definitely agree with you. And so the nature but, of the practice mm -hmm. increases the, the, the challenge around this. Mm -hmm. The, um, um, The sensitivity to the one thing I have found most interesting in the last three years, two or three years, uh, is how many Vipassana students can learn TWIM if they if they really want to learn and they really come with the idea, I want to see what this is precisely, and they're really going to do it and follow the instructions. They can move very fast down the path. And the reason they can is because they can get this, the fact that craving or always arises with tension and tightness in the mind and in the body they can sense that they've been trained to sense this throughout their body in their work with vipassana and those students can get it very fast if they haven't uh you know if they're open enough to just doing what we're telling them to do and then and then they're not adding anything else I think this may be true for uh, Goenka students, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it's the same for Mahasi. Um, well, Mahasi got very ingrained in Vasudhimaga. We have to understand that. Ledi Sayadaw's prime work in his life was the Vasudhimaga in translation mm -hmm. of the Vasudhimaga, see? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, he. It is his breath, life and breath. And so Mahasi was the same way. And the, so they were ingrained in this thing. Um, I was kind of very pragmatic about this whole thing when I came into it. I said, well, if the other way is right, well, then where are all the attainments? Where are they? And that's when I found out about all the different stories that the different groups have managed to produce. The reason why uh, the progress isn't happening and I was fascinated by some of them because it's just pure, it just isn't real. <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. our brains are different from the brains of the people in the time of the Buddha and our situations are different and our, no, we're, we're not different. Mm -hmm. All the, the basic stuff is still happening. Uh, the, the problems that humanity caused were the same then as they are now. 
maybe with a smaller number of people involved, but now it get, gets more and more dangerous the more population there is on the earth. But here we are, here we go again. And, the, and this thing that's going on now is not a new drama. It's not a new drama at all. Me as a mother, I just say boys and their toys. They need to be spanked and it all needs to be stopped. You don't want to hear what I want to run for. <laughs> You know, if I ever ran, they'd throw me out. So, but I bet you I'd get a big following, you know, with some of the things I would say. You've got to get them uh, to finish kindergarten before they do anything else. Lock them all up on an island together and let them shoot at each other somewhere else. <laughs> I thought, I thought that I, I, I'm not being disrespectful, but Sarajevo and the Serbs and Croats was a terrible, terrible war. But I just remember what indelibly impressed on me was that the soldiers on either side had no idea why they were fighting each other. It was based on something from 600 years before or something like that. And they couldn't, they could tell you their grandfathers and fathers told them they would always have to fight the other person from both sides saying the same thing, but neither one of them knew why. And when they thought about it, their father and grandfather didn't tell them why. So when mm -hmm. this, this guy did the article, he went back and researched it and it was something like 600 years old. Had no, and, and the genocide and everything that happened with that was absurd. And that's, I think that's when I came up with the terminology of boys and their toys, incurable. <laughs> you know, what can we do to replace the toys the boys insist on doing? Well, uh, like I said, I don't want to run for office, but uh, you would have to get rid of the, the uh, genetic engineering of the food. That would be the first thing to go. All those places would be illegal and they'd all have to be closed. And then <laughs> the second is you'd have to wipe out everybody that has a weapon manufacturing plant in every country in the world. That's it. And it has to be absolutely, completely illegal to make any weapons anymore for the sake of your existence on the planet. And that's it. <laughs> you know? See, as I'm, I'm just being a mother. You know? That's all this is. You know, with looking out there and saying there are grandchildren at home that I haven't seen as much as I want to do. I'm just saying, look, that's the reality. How do we make that happen? I don't know. I hmm. don't know. I'm, it's just a mystery to me, <laughs> you know? but people won't say the actual thing, boys and their toys. <laughs> and I'm sorry. I, yeah, that's it. What are you going to do? <laughs> but, but you see the, the issue, you, you understand what we're talking about tonight is really language. And, yep. and um, the problem that we face in these English translations, and when I see some of the people change them again from Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, let me point out, was the first one in English translation from Pali and in Majima Nikaya. And what, Bik, what uh, Bhante Vimala Ramsey figured out, it was a workable translation. That's what we mean by workable was he was able to uncover what he needed to uncover to get this thing to, to check it out and keep practicing and see if there was a way, another way to look at how to have the practice operate. And he got it from Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. Now they take Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, complain about it, and they change it. But I'm going to tell you right now, the changes that go on are, uh, I don't know how it's happening, but it doesn't appear to be using the... Um, the source is the way we were so careful. So some of these things, when you change them, they just don't make any sense. I can't, I don't know foreseeable future where all of it's gonna go, but it is gonna be interesting in the next hundred years. <laughs> you're gonna stick around, you're gonna stick around, try and stick around and see what happens. <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure that's in my gift, yes. <laughs> You're pretty limber. I'm not as limber as you are, but I'm working on it, <laughs> you know, slowly. So I've turned into a rabbit now and I've decided to eat at least a head of lettuce each day <laughs> and, and just eat a lot of greens. And I feel so much better now. I just, I intuitively knew this was one of the biggest problems for me, not being able to allow leafy greens, fresh leafy greens 
only boiled and stewed and pressure cooked vegetables. And I, I just, it didn't work, you know? So going back to the green greens. <laughs> Okay, so are we are we got any other questions? Anybody else? Now we're talking about greens. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, so we're gonna say goodbye. And uh, I be, I'm gonna tell you that we're if you're interested in if you are interested in teaching and stuff like that, and and you are teaching, I'm gonna try to run a program in uh, what, Bonte, April. We're gonna try to have two weekends where we do two hour classes on Saturday, two hour classes on Sunday. They could, they could probably last till three hours if people get into asking questions and get active in it, you know, it, it's open, but two hours is what we're gonna say for two weekends and try to, I'm going to dump on you. <laughs> All the things I know about when this happens, this is the solution. When this happens, this is a good solution, et cetera, and so forth. And I want people to get involved who are teaching or attempting to share this with other people to talk about what you are giving as solutions. And because it's time for me to let go of all the stuff I can possibly let go and give it to you. That's why. And so, you know, we're going to try to do this in a couple weekends and um, see whether what comes out of it. I'm going to start talking to them in a meeting this week with the trust and see if uh, we can try to set that up for teachers to come into. Okay, so let's give a prayer now. Okay. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of practice. May beings inhabiting earth and space. <laughs> Devas and Nagas of mighty power share this, share merit, this of merit of ours. May they, they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. sadhu.